Hi, it's Mike Stickler again, and what you're about to see is the actual presentation that I do while on tour. Now, I realize that some of you have been with me and have heard this presentation, but I think you're going to be pretty excited about what's going to happen at the end. So, just stay with us as we get started. This is from Spokane, Washington that I did earlier in the year. And it was just a great crowd, great people that came to join me there, super audience. And I think you're gonna be excited to hear more and more about exactly what Clive and Bundy, American Patriot, is all about. A standing ovation at the beginning. <laughs> you know, I've been doing this almost 20, or a little more than 20 years, and I've never had that happen before. So thank you, Spokane, so much. I, I really, really appreciate it. I wanna tell you, I came to this story with Cliven late, only meeting Cliven in April of last year. But I have been talking to groups like this all over what I call the red states, living in the red, those flyover states where people are just tired of the direction of the country that they love is going. Yep. And let me just give you an idea what I mean by that. I was talking to a, a gentleman on the airplane not long ago. Uh, we were both sitting in first class. Now, one of the reasons I was in first class is I, get, I travel a lot, so American Airlines upgrades me. And he was sitting next to me, and we got to talking about politics and worldview and those kinds of things. And he lived on the East Coast by all intents and purposes, he was doing well. He had mentioned that he had gone to Princeton University. He was a man who was well thought. He, he thought through things. He, he was a, a gentleman. And he got to telling me what was wrong with the people in the flyover states, which I thought was kind of funny. So I decided I would listen a little bit. He had no idea who I was. And he started to tell me about well, you know, I think that the people that are in the flyover states, they're just, you know, they're not very well educated. They really just don't understand how the world works. They don't really grasp what, how the economy is driven. And a little later in the conversation, now I don't want you to be offended, okay? Because what I'm about to say could offend you, <laughs> right? Ah, uh, thank you. I was going to say, no snowflakes, right? And, and, and he said, but what I'm convinced is that the people in the red states are brainwashed. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? You're going to say that next to me. I'm going to drill into that one a little bit to find out what exactly do you mean by brainwashed. He says, well, it's simple. These, these folks, all they have is AM radio. <laughs> And we all know that AM radio is all kind of scratchy and there's just not very good, uh, you know, um, programming on it. And the truth is, is that they just, they just are so backwards, it's almost hopeless. <laughs> and if it wasn't for those of us on the coast to keep the enlightenment going forward. Yeah. God help us. Tonight I'm going to tell you about one of those backwards guys, my friend, Cliven Bundy. Now, as I mentioned, I came late to this, just April of this year. And if you've read my bio or looked into me at all, you'll know how we met. I, myself, first heard about Cliven in 2014 when the standoff, or as Cliven refers to it, the protest occurred. But at that moment in my life, I was fighting with the federal government myself. I had been indicted in 2012, and by the time I got to 2014, I was in the midst of preparing for a federal trial and the fight of my life as the IRS attempted and successfully put me in prison. And so when I heard about what happened with Cliven and all of those that were there, 
it just kind of hit my radar. It, it, it really, I didn't really pay that much attention to it. But I'm a Nevadan, so what did catch my ear is the understanding that he was fighting against the BLM primarily, the Bureau of Land Management, and, and there was a long battle going on. Now, I'm familiar with it because when you're from Nevada, you fight with the BLM all the time. 87% or 85%, excuse me, of, of Nevada is claimed to be owned by the BLM. And in northern Nevada, where I live, the battle is typically over ranch land, range, and the wild horses. And it goes on and goes on. I, some of you might remember back in the 90s, in Nevada, they had actually um, bombed the BLM office in, in Reno. So this is an ongoing thing. And so I'm familiar with it. But I didn't pay much attention to it. And then in, two, in uh, 2016, I'm sitting in federal prison in California. And I'm watching TV. And I'm, I hear that there's a takeover at, Malyard, at the Malyard Refuge. And... The Bundys are there, and I'm like, what are they doing there? I mean, they're from way down in Mesquite, Nevada, southern Nevada. Now they're in Idaho, I mean, excuse me, in Oregon. What are they doing there? And then a few months later, where it really stuck with me, still in prison in California, by the way, their, their federal trial comes to a conclusion, those in Oregon, it comes to a conclusion and they're all found innocent and they're let go. And the men in California celebrated. The men that were incarcerated. Yeah. And where it really stuck with me is that night, we gathered in the chapel and we held hands at nine o'clock that night and we prayed and we thank God that those men were free. See, every man in, in that prison had gone through what we call the train wreck of an indictment and a trial, and 97% of those that go to trial end up incarcerated. So that was my extent of what I ever thought was going to happen with me and the Bundys. I get to the end of my sentence, I was sentenced to a 30-month sentence, and when I got to the end of my sentence, they were transferring me from California back to Nevada, and they dropped me off for just a couple of days in a private prison in this little town outside of, Nevada, of Las Vegas called Pahrump. And they dressed me out in my blues, look, blue scrubs and my bright orange Crocs. And they pushed me into the, into the G2 unit. And as prison typically works, what happens is the people of your race will approach you. It's very ra racial motivated in there. The people of your race, so the white folks come, guys come up to me and they want to know where I'm from and what institution and what car or what, who do I identify with and these kinds of things. And then one of them says, you're from Nevada? And I said, yeah. And they go, have you ever heard of Clive and Bundy? And I go, well, sure. And he goes, well, he's right over there. You should go over and say hello to him. Well, you guys, one of the first things you don't do in prison is we'll go over and talk to the guys somebody suggested. <laughs> okay. So I waited a couple of days and then I wandered over and I, I said, Cliven, I, I'm Mike Stickler. Now Cliven's sitting in his bunk. He has a coveted wall bunk. He'd been there so long that he was actually up against a wall so he didn't have anybody next to him. He was sitting there writing and, and, and uh, I walked up and I said hello and, and Cliven says, he looks at me and he says, why don't you sit down and tell me about yourself? And he cleared a little spot on Davy Bundy's bunk, and I sat down there, and he was serious. He wanted to know about me. And I started telling him about my backgrounds in agriculture, and I started telling him about my experiences and what I've done and where our connecting points were. And he immediately asked me, can you help me with my breeding program with my cattle? And I said, well, tell me what your problems are. See, I, I uh, studied agriculture. I did a, a graduate work uh, at the time out at uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. And I minored in farm animal reproduction. Okay, so he wanted to know more. He had never gone to college. He had only gone to high school. 
Well, quite frankly, he taught me more than I ever knew. And yet he genuinely wanted to know. And so we spent the next week, week and a half, talking about ag and talking about old stories of cowboying and different things that we had done, the kinds of horses we've ridden, all kinds of things like that. Now, I want you to understand, I, I, I did cowboy when I was younger. I uh, ran on a cow, I worked on a cow-calf operation, but my main focus was cutting horses, and they still are. And that's what I was interested in. And quite honestly, as a young man, I came to the realization there's a lot easier ways to make money than in the ranching business. I said that in Chalice, um, Idaho two days ago, and they all shook their heads going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so we became prison friends. And while we were there, um, eventually, I had to ask the question, so, so tell me, what happened at the standoff? Now, I never ask anybody that question when you're locked up. You never ask that. You know why? Because it really just gives them an opportunity to lie to you. But I had gotten to know this man, and I, and I really liked him. And, and, and when I first met him, what I really expected was a crazy man. I describe in the book a wackadoo, okay? I expected within short time we would be getting tinfoil hats out and putting them on and he'd be telling me, because why was I thinking that? Because honestly, who takes on the federal government and risks their entire life like he has? I know firsthand what it's like to battle against the government and how difficult it is to win. I understand the pressure they put you under when they threaten to incarcerate your spouse, take everything you own, uh, take your money, take your, uh, all your property from you. For, in my case, they threatened to go after my daughter-in-law even. And so I understood what he was up against. Sometimes I wonder, at least at that time, even more than he did. And so a man that takes it on like that has either got to be crazy or he's got to be a man that's really full of conviction. So as we got knowing each other a little more, I asked him about the standoff, which he refers to it as a protest, and I'll explain to you what, that, what I mean by that in a minute. And he got out his little, uh, he likes to, when he talks, he likes to draw, just rudimentary drawings. So as he's telling me this, he's got a notepad out and a, and a pencil and he's drawing the, basically the a map and here's the highway and here's where his ranch is and here's where the, the uh, stage was and this is the Toquap wash where the protest went on and how far they had to come and, and he just walked me through it. And the more I listened to it, I, the more I went, wow, th this is not at all what I thought it was about. And a little bit later, he'd share a little bit more with me, and a little bit later, he'd share a little bit more with me. And then eventually what happened was he and I were walking for exercise around the unit that we lived in. And, and the unit really was about the size of this building. It's about 75 by 75. So if you can picture two men just kind of walking the perimeter around and around, just getting exercise. He didn't go out that often. He did, but not that often out into the rec yard because it's difficult for a, a man his age to cope with all these other guys doing all these other things. It's much easier to just get exercise inside. So we were walking and and I, by the way, I'd met Todd Engel along the way, and Todd had um, told me about this, this uh, weird production company called Longbow. And, and I said, what's Longbow? And he goes, ask Cliven, just ask Cliven. So I thought that was a good time. So as I'm walking the laps with him, I said, Cliven, tell me about Longbow Productions. What's that? And he begins to tell me about how the FBI had infiltrated his family after the standoff with the sole purpose of trying to capture from his family and some of the other men that were there uh, evidence of their plan and their strategy. Now this is a rare thing. The only reason I know this is because of my first-hand experience. 
The government will do this before the crime has committed, but almost never after the crime has committed. And more than that, they pretended to be journalists. Now this didn't go well with the Associated Press. They actually sued the FBI over this, wanting to know how many other times did they pretend to be journalists. Because if you think about it, if you think you're talking to a journalist and you're actually talking to an undercover FBI agent, it's going to, it's going to certainly leech the trust out of your soul and telling the media what's going on. It's certainly going to put a wet cloth on your First Amendment rights, isn't it? And as I'm walking this and he's telling me this, I am, I can't believe what I'm hearing. And I said, Cliven, you gotta write a book. You gotta tell your story. You've got to tell it. Nobody understands your story. Well, he told me some other things and I've learned later that actually Cliven was kind of slow at telling me some of the stories because he thought I was an FBI agent. <laughs> and so did Mel and Davey, who I became friends with, because they had been infiltrated so many time by, times by either actual FBI agents and or confidential informants who were paid by the FBI. So they, they, it didn't put them past them that the FBI put a guy like me into the prison to befriend them. So they were slow about warming up to me. Completely understand it. So I said to him again, Cliven, you got to write a book. This is amazing. Now see, I've written books myself and I just found it just a compelling story. But I wasn't thinking about me doing it. Remember, I was only gonna be in Pahrump for a couple of days. In fact, the longer I was there, the angrier I got because I was like just that far from being released and yet I wasn't. And it became frustrating. And so eventually, Cliven looks at me and he goes, you should write it. So I'm, I'm a Christian guy, so I went, I went back to my bunk that night and I prayed about it and I thought about it. And I went back to Clive and I said, I'll write this book, but I have a couple of parameters. One, it has to be your story from you. I, I'm not interested in knowing about any of the other men in here because I was, you know, there was 18 other guys that were in Pahrump with us that were locked up. The inmates called them the Bundy 19, okay? And they had a tremendous respect, by the way, in, in Pahrump. A, a pretty hard prison, much harder than where I was in California, much harder. And so I told him, look, I only want to know your story, okay? I only want to understand it from your perspective. And from that point forward, I didn't really talk to Mel or Davey or Jerry or Todd or um, any of the other guys about it because I, I didn't, I don't know, I see some guys here with gray hair. You guys will associate, you'll get what I'm about to say. I'm realizing that I don't have as many brain cells as I used to. I can't remember it as well as I used to. And see, I didn't have a recording device, I didn't have the internet, I didn't have anything but a short stubby pencil and legal pads. So I spent the next six weeks interviewing him. We spent most of the day together as I wrote down and wrote down all of what he told me. And I found out that Cliven's a pretty brilliant man. Much of what you'll see in the book, he quoted from memory, not perfectly, but enough for me to understand where to go and get it and quote it exactly. Cliven told me that he wasn't much for education, but he almost has the Constitution perfectly memorized. Cliven's a brilliant man that's a, just a regular old farmer rancher that I've met a hundred of in the past. Honest, kind, and always caring about others around him. And so as I wrote that story, what I did is I would take each page, and, or a, a group of pages rather, and I'd stuff them in an envelope and I'd mail them to my wife, and my wife would begin to type them. And when I, when I finally was released, two months later, so much for a couple days, right? That's how the government does everything, right? 
And, and I finally got released. I, a friend of mine, a pastor in Las Vegas, had a, has a church there. He loaned me an office and my editors there as well. And the two of us sat in that office and did the research and verified everything that Cliven had told me and the directions. We researched and wrote and researched and wrote and researched and wrote until we had an author's manuscript prepared. Each of those pages, every one of them got sent back into Pahrump for Cliven's review until we finally got the, the, the final uh, documents. Right up, right up through um, uh, just the beginning of the trial, we were still editing documents, beginning of his trial in November. We were still editing documents for a delivery of December 1st. Takes, usually takes two years to roll a book out. We got it done in less than six months. And it took a whole bunch of effort. So what I want to share with you tonight is just to kind of help you get understand first where did the story come from but more than that I want you to understand Cliven's 25 year fight. At this point I've kind of gotten to know Cliven really well and I understand his family history and I understand what's going on. People come and ask me about Malyard Refuge and those kinds of things and I'll tell you right up front I don't know much about it because I I was focused on Cliven and what he was doing. So let me, let me just set the stage for you. James Madison wrote, the government is instituted to protect property of every sort, as well that which lies in various rights of individuals, as which that term expresses. This being the end of government that alone is a just government which impartially secures to every man whatever is his own. An unjust government, one which fails to secure the property of its citizens, is one which property, where property, excuse me, where property which a man has is violated by arbitrary seizures of one class of citizen for the service of the rest. See, most of us learned in high school that the Revolutionary War was about taxation without representation. But equally as important to the colonists was property rights. And the reason why is because the king, when conquering a land, as they, they did, the British Crown did America, as they conquered a land, the king took it as his own property. And then through his deputies, if you will, through earls and, and uh, lords and whatnot, they would oversee that property and then it would be uh, enforced by the army, by the British army. So the colonists were not satisfied with, but used to the fact that they would go and they would build a farm or they would build a ranch or they would build a a mercantile and then the British would come in and just take it from them or the British would just come in and charge them rent. Can you imagine building your own home, tilling the land, get it, doing three or four years of crops or maybe ten years of crops and then the British come in and say hey by the way you need to start charging us rent. Or I'm going to start charging you rent. Yeah and, and it continued and continued and Thomas Jefferson especially, but also Madison and most of the founding fathers objected to this. And you can see that objection throughout the Constitution from Article 1 to the Third Amendment to the Fourth Amendment. Remember when they, the Fourth Amendment says, yeah, the, the Fourth Amendment says um, that you can't bring the soldiers into a, a person's home and quarter them by force, remember? Or how about property rights? You can't go in and seize a man's property or a family's property without due process. And Article 1 describes very clearly that the idea is that the federal government is not to own large swaths of land. That was their understanding. So what happened? How did we get from that idea to really where it really went south is 1976 when the uh, FLIPMA, the Federal Land Practices Management Act, yes, um, let me make sure I had the acronym right, 
was established. And in FLIPMA, in 1976, the federal government just finally said it, we own the land. Prior to that, they, they operated under a stewardship process, but now they've declared that they own it. So how did we get there? Well, right after the Revolutionary War, our government took a two degree turn, just, just a small turn. Now, if you've ever navigated by compass, you'll know that if you start in one point and you go two degrees off, the longer you go and the farther you go, the further you're off course. And we've, from that point, see what happened was is that the uh, Continental Congress actually decided that they had debt that they had to settle from the Revolutionary War. They had no um, income tax at the time. That didn't come until 1913. And so they decided they would sell land to the settlers. Virgin land, basically west of the original 13 colonies. Thomas Jefferson threw a fit. He wrote a letter and, and said, how could we leave such a happy accord and return back to the very style of, of property ownership that we rejected under the crown? And as it proceeded forward, you can see benchmarks in history of where we've ruled one time or another away from where the government is not to own large swaths of land, but instead just have reasonable property under territories they were suppo supposed to give that completely over to the states when they became a state. This was the plan. Now since that time it's changed and changed and changed until we get to 1976 under FLIPMA. And out of FLIPMA the Bureau of Land Management was born. And when it was born out of that, at first they also managed things pretty similarly as a stewardship kind of process. But in time, in a short amount of time, in less than 20 years, they became more and more that benevolent landlord, just like the British Crown, making decisions 3,000 miles away, just like the British Crown, over large virgin swaths of land in our state, in Nevada, they claim to own 85% of the land. 85%. And this is the setting, I want you to understand, where Cliven comes from. All of what I just shared with you is what Cliven taught me. So, Cliven also understood growing up on the ranch that he's on today. Now, I want you to understand that Cliven has 160 deeded acres, which is his ranch headquarters, and then which is very common uh, in the West, especially in places like Nevada and Colorado and others. He has a 6,000, I'm sorry, excuse me, 600,000 grazing range that surrounds his 160 acre headquarters, where his ancestors have been grazing cattle officially for 161 years. His ancestors actually trailed out with the Mormon missionaries when it was still Mexico. Okay, so he can track it all the way back. Now, by the way, you'll see mainstream media who will say, oh, well, that's just a lie. He, you know, his father didn't establish anything until 1948, which is true. His father established the headquarters in 1948, okay? But it's not too hard to figure it out considering in Mesquite, Nevada, there's a giant statue down there that celebrates Cliven's maternal side of founding that area and grazing cattle and farming in that area. It's just not that hard to find. It goes back all those years. So Cliven understands his rights, but his father also taught him that under the Taylor Grazing Act of 1934, that the, what used to be the Bureau of Land Management before they kind of evolved, they had three responsibilities the government had. To adjudicate differences between the ranchers. Because in 19, earlier than 1930, in the late 20s, the ranchers were fighting over where they could graze and who got there first and there's all these range wars going on. So what they would do is they'd put together a local board of ranchers and they would 
hear the arguments in their cases, and then that local board of ranchers would make a decision, and then it was recorded. Well, as it, as it grew, a lot of this um, happened over state lines as more and more of the states came into the union, so they decided that made sense for it to fall under the Bureau of Land Management's practices to manage that. The BLM also came along and said, well, how about now that we're helping you with this, we will also take care of the range improvements, roads, fences, irrigation, all of those things. And yet, if we're going to do it, we want to we want to pay a small we want you ranchers to pay a small fee to do the for this service. The ranchers thought that was a reasonable thing, so they agreed with it. That's where you get the whole that's the whole birth of the idea of grazing permits and the things that we hear about today. That's the birth of it. So now we get to 1992, and they come to Cliven, and they have decided. Prior to 1992, in, in uh, Clark County, Nevada, they have now driven out every rancher except for Cliven. 53 of Cliven's friends. In the front of the book, you'll see all his friends and, 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 and some relatives that the government drove out. Why'd they do this? Because they had decided, they had a, they had a policy, no more moo by 92. And the plan was, is to eliminate all livestock grazing in Clark County, Nevada. Why? Because they were working towards an endangered species being established, which was the desert tortoise. And the environmentalists were pressing hard to protect the land for the desert tortoise. So they were pushing the farmers and ranchers out, and they came to Cliven in 1992, and they said, hey, you know what, we got this new agreement with you. You're going to be thrilled. And here's what his agreement said. You had, to, you had to reduce your herd size by 90%, and you could only graze your cattle June, July, and August. And you guys, June, July, and August in the Mojave Desert is 117 degrees. There is no water, and there is no feed. They offered him nothing. And Cliven said, you know what? You're fired. Now you've seen that in the news where he fired the BLM. He is, his mindset is, look, I'm paying them a small fee, one-tenth of what it would cost to go rent private land for grazing. I'm paying a small fee for them to maintain the range improvements to record and to adjudicate problems. That's why I pay, I think it's like a dollar eighty an animal unit, where you would you would pay something around eighteen dollars on a private ranch. Because it's not about grass, they're not renting grass, they're paying for a service. So he fired him and he said, you know what, going forward, I'll take care of my own range improvements. And we certainly don't have any arguments between the neighbors because you ran them all off. So he fired him. So by 1998, the government took him to federal court to drive him off. Now, why did they care? Because the Center for uh, biological diversity said, we will sue you, government, if you don't remove the last cattle off the range. Now, by the way, never mind that uh, it's proven now that cattle don't interfere with, with tortoises, they don't hurt them, but that doesn't matter, because it's never really about the tortoises. So. They went after Cliven in 1998 and they got a judgment. Now, I've, again, I've answered a lot of critics about this. They got a summary judgment against Cliven. What that means is Cliven's not a rich man, okay, despite what the news says. He's not a rich man. He lives in a three-bedroom house, one bath. He raised 14 kids in it. It's the same home that his father built in, 19, in the 1940s. It's a simple little house. He talks about his front porch. He doesn't have a front porch. He just has grass and a stoop. Okay, it's a small little place. He has no barn. He's just a simple rancher out in the middle of the desert. And so when he was taken to federal court, he attempted to answer the lawsuit by being his own lawyer. 
And in short order, the government lawyers filed a summary judgment against him and the judge gave it to him. Just like that. He never got in front of the judge. He never got in front of a jury. He never got to really tell his side. So what happened after 1998? Nothing. They didn't do anything. Why? Because they kinda, the, the environmentals kind of lost interest. There were some other fights going on in and around Las Vegas. And then what ended up finally bringing it all back to a head is in 2008 we got a new administration, right? Government administration. You guys remember that? That was the time when all of your savings accounts were cut in half and your property went dropped by at least a third. You guys remember that day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we had a new administration. That new administration was all about alternative energy, right? Well, when you look at Cliven's Ranch, this is what you see. To the west of it is a now a 15,000 acre solar farm. To the south of it is a 5,000 acre solar farm on an Indian reservation, on the Paiute reservation. And to the east of it is always been the Gold Butte recreational area, now the Gold Butte National Monument. So the difficulty is, and I want you to understand why this happened and why it happened in 2014. The difficulty was is under the Endangered Species Act, in order to take land from the tortoises, you have to give them land somewhere else for perpet in perpetuity. It's called mitigation. Now, guess who developed that idea? Senator Harry Reid. Just north of Las Vegas is a beautiful little subdivision community called Summerlin. Summerlin is actually quite nice. In order for that developer to get Summerlin, he had to take part of the Mojave Desert and, and uh, desert tortoise habitat in order to build, build this. Most of you all know Las Vegas has been sprawling out into the desert for about 30 years now, maybe more. And as it sprawls out into the desert more and more, it has to take habitat from the endangered species, which is the tortoise. And so in order to do that, they swap land and they designate areas for the tortoise. My, my sister said, anybody tell the tortoises they have to move? <laughs> have they moved yet? Do they have the, you know, what does it take? Because it's really not about the tortoises, it's really just about managing all this. Now, you guys might be wondering, how did I know that? Well, first off, Cliven told me about it. I said, what's this all about? And he says, it's about land swaps. That's all he told me. You're going to laugh at this. Tell me this isn't God. When I was in California in prison, I was in there with Harry Reid's lawyer. <laughs> We're friends. <laughs> And he invented the land swap thing. In fact, in, in Southern Nevada, his last name is Hated because he would come down there and, and mitigate and litigate land and build golf courses and casinos and all kinds of things. So in order for that land to all work out and turn into these solar farms. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention, 150 miles away, there was a five, a projected $5 billion solar project um, 150 miles away near Lake Havasu. Now again, the media all goes, oh, that has nothing to do with it. They're 150 miles away. It has everything to do with it because if you're gonna take that land, you have to have somewhere else for those tortoises, even if it's 150 miles away. So Harry Reid um, went to President Obama and said, let's take the Gold Butte recreational area and turn it into a national monument. And even President Obama just didn't have the gumption to do it. He go, he basically, it's gonna take too much legislative work and we just got beat in the midterms by the Republicans and we have to stop the red tide. And so, no, I'm not willing to do that. So Clive and Bundy's ranch became the focus. 
Why not? Here's this old scofflaw who has no money. We already have a judgment against him. Let's just run the old bugger off the land. And now we got 600,000 acres we can designate. And eventually we can enfold that into the Gold Butte National Monument, which will solve all the problems for the solar farms and everything else. What they didn't count on was Cliven Bundy and the American people. What they didn't count on is a guy that was going to say no and stand up against him. Okay. Thank you. So you have to understand why the timing is so important. So in 2012, one of the things that FLIPMA requires is if the BLM is going to take action, they have to get the county sheriff to do the law enforcement action. It's part of the law. So they go to the sheriff in Clark County and they say, Sheriff Gillespie, will you enforce this? And he says, no, you've got to freshen up your, your uh, judgment. So they go back to court in 2012. And they freshen up their judgment and that the, the judge gives them another one. At this time, by that time, they had done a numerous amount of cattle counts out on the range, charging, uh, ultimately giving the bill over to Cliven, $360,000 bill over to Cliven for going out and counting cows. Because they're having a hard time figuring out which cows out on the range are Cliven's and which ones are not. Only about 400 of the close to 1,100 cows that are out there have Cliven's brand or earmark on them. The rest of them have no brand whatsoever. No identification. They're feral. I asked Cliven when I was in Trump, where'd they come from? He goes, most of them were from my 53 neighbors who threw up their hands and walked away and just left their cows out there or left some of them that they couldn't find. And they've actually turned into their own herd and over 20 years have turned into a significant size herd of cows that are wandering around out on the range. Cliven even offered to help the government collect those animals and bring them in and they said they'd give him the money. He said, I can't take the money, they're not my cattle. The minute I try to take them to a sales yard, I'll go to jail, the brand inspector will throw me in jail. I can't do that. Of course, the federal government can't put those things together. And so, they don't understand, right. And so, <laughs> that's good. And so what ends up happening is they get a fresh judgment. Now, I want you guys to catch this. The judgment says that they can seize his cattle and impound them, nothing else. And they can charge him $200 a day for trespass cattle. And they're, and they're basically counting every cow that ever happened in Clark County as his, brand or not. Okay. And so, now they've got this new judgment and they go back, the BLM goes back to the Clark County Sheriff and, and a negotiation begins between a guy named Dan Love, who's the head of law enforcement for Nevada and Utah, law enforcement for the BLM under Nevada and Utah. And he has this grandiose plan of how he's going to go in and with an army and do all of these things. And the, and the sheriff says, I'm out. He actually says on television, he says, no cow is worth an American's blood. Now, he also went on to say, you know, we're a real live law enforcement here in Clark County in Las Vegas. We deal with human beings all the time. We know our people are professionally trained and what you're about to do is going to turn into a disaster. Well, they didn't pay any attention. And so when 2014 came around and they were, they were ready to make their move, another interesting piece for you all to understand is Neil Quartz, who became the head of the BLM, used to be Harry Reid's chief of staff. He's a 34-year-old man that has no experience in land management whatsoever, and they put him in charge of the entire nation's department of the Bureau of Land Management. And of course, miraculously, this whole mo uh, thing gets set in motion. They come down to the Bundy Ranch. They set up a compound. They had a $4 million budget to gather his cattle. Okay? 
They paid $1 million to contract cowboys to come down and collect them. Oh, and one of the other things that the sheriff objected to is that they were planning on doing the roundup in April right in the middle of the calving season. And, and he knew that it was going to be a disaster to try to bring a bunch of rangy mother cows, and these are rangy cows, and try to separate them by helicopter with, from their babies and drive them tens of miles across the range to be gathered. He says it's just going to turn into a disaster. He also found that Dan Love lied to him multiple times. He wasn't going to, he didn't work like that. So he wouldn't be part of it. So the BLM went ahead and put together an army of 200 men, MRAPs, drones, cameras. They, they, uh, if we found out in the court that they were wiretapping the Bundys illegally with no court order. They went at them like they were terrorists. Now, you guys, Cliven has said, and his boys have said all along, we will do whatever it takes to keep this from happening. The media grabbed that and said, oh, that means he's going to do terrible things and you know they're going to have bombs and guns and, and whatnot. Whatever it takes was really a statement of resolution. We're not going to let you do this. A statement of commitment. That's what it was. We find out later, in, in a little bit, I'm going to bring Sherry Duvall up here, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this, but we find out later that they had, been, they had done a threat assessment on the Bundys, five of them, since 2011, and every one of them came back that they were no threat. The FBI did this. So they had no excuse to think that these people were dangerous. They all came back as not dangerous. And one, one of them said, if you get in the Bundy boy's face, you might get punched. Yeah. And so they came at them like you cannot imagine. Okay. And what ended up, what, some of the key points of what ended up happening, and I'm just going to hit on them that day, that's that is really not told by the media, that's really not told by folks. And, and this is key to understand. On Thursday, okay, on Saturday before the, the, the famous standoff that you've seen the pictures of of the protesters in the wash, on, this, on the Sunday before, Davy Bundy has come to see his mom and wish her happy birthday. Hours before he gets there, his sister Stetsy has had an altercation with BLM agents. See, they have surrounded the ranch, they put in checkpoints, they've closed down highways, state highways, they closed down the state highways. They had these, the, the Bundy Ranch under siege. And so Davey decides he wants to go out and see what, now he told me this, okay, person to person, he goes, I want to go out and see, I want to go out and see exactly what they were doing. So he takes his car and he parks on a state highway. He's just a little off the shoulder, safely parked. There's no traffic because they closed it all off. He takes his iPad out and he's filming the trucks going by and some of the BLM operations. And here comes, as he put it, 15 to 20 BLM agents actually march stepping down the hill together. I've seen the videos, okay, the, the uniform cam uh, videos and the, and the vehicle cam videos. He's standing there by himself, holding an iPad, leaning on his car. There's no one around. And they come marching down after him. And as they come marching down to him, uh, Ryan Bundy drives up in his van, along with Davy's wife, his wife and the kids. And Ryan gets in a little bit of an argument. What are you doing? Why are you, what are you going to do with my brother? That kind of thing. And the, and the ladies in the van said, let's go. We got to go. We got the kids in here. We can't do this now. So Ryan drives away, leaving Davey there by himself. And they came up to him and they said, you can't video here. And he said, well, well why not? And because uh, you're not allowed to. And he goes, well, I have a First Amendment right to do this. Why can't I video? And he goes, no, no, if you want... If you want to practice your First Amendment right, you have to go to a First Amendment zone that we've built over here. We built two convenient ones where you can't see them, no one can see them, they're hidden off the road. That's where you can exercise your First Amendment rights. He said, no, my First Amendment rights are where I am. 
and they arrested him. They threw him to the ground, they stepped on his head, they sicked their dogs on him. He's a big guy like me, so when they went to pull him to the ground, he braced himself. He never really had that happen to him before, so he braces himself. He wasn't resisting arrest, braces himself, falls on the ground. They scoop him up, and then they put him in a car, or actually in an SUV, and they take him to the compound or headquarters, and they leave him there for a couple hours, and then they walk him out, and they, they do a perp walk with him, where they walk him out to show him off in front of all the other officers. They just walk him in circles. And brought them all out so they could see, look at the trophy we have. And then they put him back in the car, left him there for a few more hours, and then eventually they took him into, into, um, into Las Vegas, where he spent the night, and the next day he ended up in the federal courthouse, and they came to ask him questions to interrogate him, and the only questions they had for him is, do you beat your wife? And how many wives do you have? Because he's Mormon. Had nothing to do with being on the roadside or anything else. Then after they've questioned him, they hand him all his possessions back but his iPad and kick him out the front door of the courthouse on the streets. And then Wednesday comes along. By the way, that's all vi that, that video and his interview by the media and everything, it goes viral across social media. Up until that point, you guys, until the video started to go out there, the whole, te the whole protest was about 50 to 100 friends and family of the Bundys. And they would come down and hold a sign for an hour or two, maybe a whole day, and then they'd go home and go back to work. It just wasn't a big deal going on. It wasn't a big, massive, a lot of folks. It's just some people going, don't take his cows. And that video, and then Margaret Houston's video, that's the video of, of uh, Cliven's sister being thrown to the ground like a sack of grain. She's not a real big woman, and the guy that grabs her is my size. I've watched the video up, uh, dozens of times. He picks her up and slams her on the ground for no reason. He later on testifies that he was trying to save her life. <laughs> of course, Ammon rolls up, and he's a little mad. Imagine that. I, I, if somebody did that to my wife, you'd, you'd find me pretty upset. And he gets into an argument with him, yelling and screaming, and he gets tased four times and will not go down, which is miraculous. I've seen dozens of men tased. I've never seen one of them stay on their feet. Of course, that video is captured live, and it goes viral. And this is, those two videos is what caught America's attention to what's going on at the Bundys. If they, if they, meaning the BLM, hadn't come down and played such a hard case role in this, it would have just been a blip on everybody's thought life. But because they came so hard, and because of people like Sherry, well, you're not Sherry, Sherry. <laughs> Sherry, you got a beard. <laughs> have I talked that long? Really? <laughs> um, people like Sherry and so many others who have worked so hard to bypass the mainstream media and get news out to, to people to, to find out what was going on. And there, by, in a short order of time, there was over a million hits, and that's why people came from all over the country to Bunkerville. Well, when the, when the BLM found out about that and saw what was going on, they realized they were behind the PR eight ball, if you will. And so, it was Thursday night. Remember, um, Margaret Houston and, and um, Ammon happened on Wednesday. It was Thursday night. We find out from um, Dan Love, when they finally got him in the courtroom for an evidentiary hearing, we find out from him and the rest of the BLM agents that they, he had ordered them to begin to, to get prepared to leave. They had already decided Thursday night that the standoff was over. They ordered, he ordered them to shred all the evidence. They, can't, they sent all the cowboys, the contract cowboys, to go home. There was still some gathering of cattle going on by um, south of them, and, but you can look at the cattle counts I have. I, in fact, I put them in the book. They drop off real quickly how many cattle they're gathering. 
and Friday completely ends. By Friday, they have a phone call. Dan Love, the then U.S. Attorney Dan Bogdan in Las Vegas, um, apparently the sheriff, I'm not, it's still unclear, and apparently some higher up in, in Washington have a phone call and they make a plan on how to capture the Bundys in all of this. And their plan is, we're going we're gonna to cease the operation, but we want Cliven to go to the compound and release the pin or pull the pin and open the gates. Because if Cliven opens the gates and lets the cattle out, we now have him for obstruction of justice, interfering for a lot with law enforcement activity and whatnot. That was their plan. So by Friday, it's official, it's over. Okay, you track and this is real important because everybody kind of misses it. So by Saturday, the sheriff, Sheriff Gillespie, comes to the standoff, or actually to the protest, comes to the stage and announces it's over. The roundup is over, the cattle will be released. And so all the protesters hoot and holler and celebrate and are excited this happens. Cliven makes some demands upon the sheriff. I've covered that in the book. And he says, I will wait for you, Sheriff, to come back and tell us what's going on. Now, Cliven, being a man of his word, stayed at that stage the whole day. He never went to the Tokwap Wash. He stayed on the stage the entire day. Cliven Bundy never had a gun the entire time. The, out of all the Bundy boys, only uh, Ryan Bundy had a pistol wearing it in an open carry position, which you can do in Nevada and he never took it out of its holster. Why that's important is because the federal government charged Cliven, his sons, and the other 19, or the balance of the 19, for pointing guns at federal agents and threatening and assaulting them. And Cliven wasn't even in the wash. He stayed there the whole day waiting for the sheriff. So an hour and a half, two hours went by, and they all went down into the wash to go down there to collect the cattle now you got to understand it takes a little bit of time. There's several miles from the stage to the to the wash. They had to they, they blocked off the highway. They had to find a place to park, and then they all got out of their cars and they slowly. There's about 270 people that came down into the wash and kind of bled out into the wash as more and more people came out. And as they came, the first thing that they did was they kneeled in prayer. Why? Because they they discovered when they get to the wash. There's all these law enforcement officers pointing guns at them and threatening to shoot them. And a whole bunch of incidents has happened down there. I covered them in the book, play by play. Now, by the way, I looked at every video. I looked at all, I got a hold of as much of the radio traffic between the, all the officers and I pieced together exactly what happened that day. Much of it I took verbatim, so I took the videos and I had them transcribed, then I cleaned them up so it made them a little easier to read. If you've ever seen a transcription of somebody talking, it's not really easy to follow. I cleaned it up so you could read it. And I tell you in the book, I, this is the verbatim, you know, edited lightly for readability. So no one would question what was said or what happened. And I put it in chronological order so you can, by the events, so you can know exactly what happened that day. Because my passion was, as I wrote this book, is for you to decide who Cliven Bundy is. That's my passion. I put it all out there, his warts and all. Some things I wouldn't have said, but he said them. Things that happened I wouldn't have done, but he did. And I don't judge it. I just am putting it down there to, for you to understand. These are the activities. These are the things that happened that day and why they happened. One of the things that the news doesn't tell you is that Ammon Bundy down in the wash that day told the, the men that had rifles, they call them long guns, but it, it had rifles to move to the back behind the last bridge so nothing dangerous would happen. Five times he told them to go back. It turns out that, according to the federal government, there's roughly 21 men down there with rifles. It also turns out that at least 15 of them were confidential informants paid by the government. 
maybe more. The balance, I'm assuming, were my friends and, and the guys that I was in Pahrump with. I'm not really sure. Why? Because the government won't release that because it's confidential informants. But it's not real hard to figure out because many of those same confidential informants came out in the trial in Mallard Refuge. And all you've got to do is take the list of names and compare them. It's just not that hard. Plus, during the trial, the criminal trial, I got a kick out of it. The, the defense attorney, they started out the prosecution showing slides similar to this. See this guy? Look at him with a gun. Look at him with a the gun. Then the defense got up there. See this guy? He was a confidential informant. See this guy? He was paid by the government. It was hilarious because <laughs> they took him apart. So I want to end with this last little piece, and then I'm going to have Sherry come up, and we're going to talk about the, the trial a little bit. Eventually, if you remember, I said that Clive and Bundy was protesting the sheriff. He's having a protest, and he was protesting the sheriff because the sheriff wouldn't stand um, between him and the government and protect his property and protect his home and protect his own life. That was what the protest was about. And eventually, the sheriffs did just that. When Sheriff Gillespie came to the bridge, he also brought the undersheriff and the deputy undersheriff and a bunch of deputies. And they told him that they were all, it was over and they were leaving. And then this whole thing happened in the wash. And Sheriff, under Sheriff Lombardo, now the sheriff of Clark County, um, said on television, he said, you know, all it would have taken is one backfire somebody going by, one backfire, and it would have been the worst massacre in American history. And so we felt we had to do something. So they literally, and I've heard the, the, the audio tape, they literally commanded the BLM to back off. Then they got down in the wash with them without SWAT gear or anything and got in the middle and ordered them off. There was this whole um, aggressive argument between Dan Love and, and uh, Ammon Bundy and Davey Bundy. And then eventually, when he's ordered off, Dan Love says something very peculiar to Ammon. He says, make sure your dad comes down here and pulls the pin. Hmm. Strange statement. First, he was arguing with Ammon, saying, we want, we'll only negotiate with your father. And, and, and Cliven's going, I'm not coming down there. You, you guys can work it out. Having no idea of the plot that was put together. So finally the sheriffs come and they stand between them. And you can hear the order. You can see uh, uh, Deputy um, Sheriff Roberts look around, uh, look at the BLM and tell them, back off, back off. They're not going to shoot you. Just back off. And the BLM guys slowly back their cars and walk in, in stacked formation all the way back. And eventually they load up their vehicles and they leave. About 200 men were there. And we'll tell you more details in a second. And there's this one really human moment, you guys. I think this is really powerful. When they start leaving, Roberts is standing there and Ammon's right on the other side of the, the uh, Powder River gate that's standing there. And Roberts looks at Ammon and he says, you know, they're, they're leaving. They're leaving. It's over. They're leaving. And Ammon looks at him and just, you could just see the, the stress boil out of him. And he goes, will you stay here? Will you stay right here with us? Roberts, Roberts and one other deputy are the only guys standing there between this potential mayhem. And Roberts, almost in a falsetto, kind of surprised, says, sure. It just kind of stands there till it's over. And when you look at that video, and I hope I carry it, covered it well in the book, you can really see the intensity of that moment and the realization that everybody thought they were going to die that day. 